many of you are podcast listeners? How many of you ha have no idea who I am, but you heard there was free food or something? <laughs> okay, I'm glad to hear that. We ran in the door, we ran to set up, ran to change clothes, and here I am. I look like Nixon when he's debating Kennedy. You know, I'm sweating, forgive me. Anybody has a towel, paper towel or something, I'd certainly take it. Uh, what I'll probably do with your permission today is a, um, it's a variation of a, of a presentation I've been giving around the Midwest um, that is very, very close to my heart. It is something that is, uh, especially since fall of last year has really been on my mind and it has to do with the targeting of, uh, of kids so we'll probably do that with your permission if you guys want I don't know how long we have the room in but four, four days <laughs> <laughs> no this is not Jonestown <laughs> there'll be Kool-Aid at the exit everybody thank you for coming um, bless you thank you did you guys catch that Christian in me come popping out at random bless you thank you Ah, oh, thank you. And then we'll do a little, uh, I, I'm not sure I like the word Q&A as much as I do, just dialogue. Let's just chat. I, I'm, I'll be learning as much from you as you are from me, okay? Okay. Well, I brought a special guest with me, and I'm going to go ahead and bring her up because I feel that introductions are important. If you're going to introduce your family, you better introduce the family. Now, I'm not shameless enough to bring a puppy to a live event to try to endear myself to the audience. After all, that would be a shameless thing to do. But this is my radio co-host. This is, her name is Tootsie. I did not name her. Um, she sits in my lap very often as we do the shows. And sometimes at the most inopportune time we'll be doing maybe a very serious topic we're talking about grieving without religion or we're talking about uh, something heavy like politics and at the most meaningful heartfelt moment somebody will ring the doorbell and this dog goes into orbit and it completely takes you out but anyway uh, she travels with us and so she came with us this weekend and I wanted her to say hi so everybody hi nice to see you Anyway, do not tell the building establishment that uh, there's an animal in here. If, this is a service dog. Um, <laughs> dog is here to serve somebody. It's funny, I'm a big dog person. I came from German Shepherds and Great Danes. And, and I remember thinking, that's not a dog. And Natalie was like, Natalie, baby, that's not a dog. It's like a... It's like a hamster. It's like a, a guinea pig gone horribly wrong. It's something that's not a dog. And that dog freaking stole my heart. And now I'm like that. You know those new parents who have the baby that won't ever touch the ground? Oh, give me that. No, no, no. Don't let her do this. Don't let her do that. I find myself doing that with the dog. I'm totally shameless. Before we left, the cat really wanted to come. And I snapped this photograph on my phone. <sighs> anyway, we'll go home and see him tonight. But I... I always like to bring the family with me when I do these live presentations. Thank you so much for coming out, for chewing into part of your weekend on a Sunday where you could be at the lake or could be doing anything. You came here and I'm tremendously honored, really, I'm not blowing smoke, to, to be able to do what I love and to be able to go and, and meet wonderful people in places like this to me is just like, it's like a vacation. It's like, it's like breathing. And, uh, so the idea that you all came and took the time to be here is a tremendous compliment and I'll try to be worthy of the time that you sort of sliced out of your weekend. Let's begin. He is a hero for our generation. He's a champion for truth and justice and all that is good in the world. In fact, he travels the world vanquishing evil. He is Bible man. <laughs> Who's familiar with Bible? Anybody seen Bible Man? A couple of you. He's an evangelical superhero in a TV series that is targeted directly to children. He has superhuman strength and all sorts of cool stuff as spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6. He's got the shoes of peace. He's got the waist belt of truth. He's got the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which looks like a lightsaber. 
Now this show debuted on TBN like 20 years ago back in 1994 and was picked up by Thomas Nelson Publishing. The behemoth publishing company picked him up and, and uh, the first half of the, the run I think starred the, the middle brother from Eight is Enough. Anyone here old enough to remember the TV show Eight is Enough? Put your hand up. You got to own it. You got to own it. The TV show is targeted to children ages 2 to 10. And there's Bible Man stuff everywhere. You can buy action figures, there's video games, there's puzzles, buy your own light sword, you can get a mask and a cape and they can run around the house, run around the neighborhood vanquishing evil. Alright, maybe you haven't heard of Bible Man as much as you've heard of these guys. Anybody know who this is? It's Bob and Larry. It's the Veggie Tales. How many of you came from religion? Woo. Okay. This is almost like a 12-step meeting then, isn't it? <laughs> when I was, in, I was in Christian radio for over a decade at KXOJ Radio, which, by the way, and this is totally off the subject, I just found out that they have removed me from the history pages of the website. I'm guessing that they don't want Seth Andrews to appear in the Google searches that are done. Uh, they don't want KXOJ to appear if anyone Google searches Seth Andrews, so I have been essentially sliced out of a decade of the radio station, which, I mean, if you have to, if you have to say it out loud, this is not the first time that Christians have revised history when it became inconvenient. Um, when I was on KXOJ, we loved the Veggie Tales. We loved it. We had them out to live broadcast. Uh, we had VeggieTales movie premieres. They actually debuted a big, uh, one of the new DVDs and we showed it at uh, a big auditorium in Tulsa called the Maybe Center, the ORU Maybe Center. We had a big live event and people brought their families out and it was a big deal. And, and they taught moral lessons. A couple of the videos are, one of them's called Where's God When I'm So Scared? And Josh and the Big Wall, God Wants Me to Forgive then. Now we liked the Veggie Tales because they provided an alternative to what the world was offering, right? All the worldly entertainment out there and they were teaching moral lessons and on the surface who could argue with it? What great lessons? Overcoming fear, overcoming adversity, forgiveness, good stuff. When you're in the church, we're like, we celebrate it. What an amazing opportunity to, to give children life lessons wrapped in scripture and sort of rescuing them and protecting them from the world. And in fact, we found that there was all sorts of veggie tale stuff you could get for your kids. You can give them a Bob or Larry costume or they could be junior asparagus and they could play an instrument or ride in the car or wear the backpack, play the game. There's even a veggie nativity scene that you can buy. Now, who's the target? Children. Churches are really, really in fast forward when it comes to the targeting of children. This is an environment designed for children's church. Now, those of you who, like me, grew up in church, remember what kids' church was like, and if you're old enough, kids' church was what? You had a room like this with probably some metal folding chairs, maybe a felt board. <laughs> you know, we sang songs, they might have puppets, they might have this or that. But anymore, this is becoming children's church, themed environments that are targeted to attract young people. Here's another one. It's uh, produced by Wonderwork Studios. It's a movie theater theme. You actually walk under the marquee and into the theater and they have a stadium style setup with a big stage on it for them to learn about Jesus Christ. Here's a luau theme where you go into the hut on the beach. Maybe there's even Hawaiian music playing in the background. Here's another one done by Wacky World Studios. It's an entrance to the classrooms through the heavens or through the clouds. You're actually in the sky and you're walking among the clouds. One of my favorites done by Worlds of Wow, it's a seafaring theme where the child workers, the secure children's check-in workers, all stand inside the ship and the kids go check in. Arr, matey! I don't know if they do the pirate thing, that's just... The <laughs> <laughs> but come on, come to, to, to on your adventure kind of a thing. And this is done mostly to attract what in the church we called seekers. Now, Young parents, when I was in Christian radio, we used to target young families for this reason. Um, we were targeting seekers. We were targeting people, and let's say there's a, a husband and wife. 
Maybe they've been involved in church, maybe they haven't been involved in church. But they have a kid, and they have a conversation that goes something like this. Honey, we need to have our child in church. You know, we haven't really gone in a long time, and we, we just haven't. But you know, now we're not just talking about you and me, we're talking about our children. We need to, and can anybody relate to this conversation? We, have, it, it, we, are, we are going to find a church, we're going to go every Sunday, we're going to do the right thing by this child. And so they start to pinball around looking for where the Lord will lead them, which is the church that they enjoy the most personally, right? This is what we do. We take our own feelings and thoughts and we project God onto them. And so uh, seeker-friendly churches are churches that are designed so that everything they do is sort of an advertising thing. And, and they do it for legitimate, mostly for sincere reasons. They really want you to come and, and belong because they want you to be part of the kingdom, part of the church family here on earth, but also eternally. They're operating largely with sincere motives. I really believe that. And so what they would do is everything from the greet ministry, the handshake ministry, the people who would greet you at the door. Who you are, how you look, how you're dressed, squaring your shoulders, the words that come out of your mouth, the kind of handshake. All of those things are really looked at to make sure that you're giving a great first impression to the people who come. The type of uh, worship experience they have. You'll find a lot of seeker churches don't do the hellfire and brimstone sermons nearly as much. They're not doing the polarizing hardcore scriptures. They're doing the Joel Osteen thing, right? Happy, happy, joy, joy stuff. You know, you can be anything you want to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. That kind of Mentos commercial preaching that we have all seen out there. And they create environments where children are brought in and they say, oh, wow, mom, dad, look at this amazing place. I want to come back here. We had so much fun and we sang songs and everything was so colorful. And, and mom and dad say, did you see their children's ministry? Wow, what an amazing, these people really are focused on kids and he'll want to come back here every Sunday. Let's keep coming. This is a, a strategic thing. And again, it's largely done, at least here in Protestant Christianity, for sincere reasons, but it's done to attract children. Normally, children will, in many cases, decide where the mother and father attend. So if you can get the kids, you got mom and dad. And it's not just young children either. CNET did an article about technology in the megachurch and how they're using computers and and all of the uh, bells and whistles to try to make church a sensory experience. Here's a youth group that was featured in the New York Times. They're uh, New Life Church in Colorado Springs. These kids are all in, right? They're not dressed up like we were growing up. You're going to dress up in your Sunday best. Well, today it's come as you are. Blue jeans and t-shirts are fine. Piercings and tattoos are fine. Whatever, just come. You know, you're welcome. And I'm sure the youth pastor on stage, although he's not in this photograph, is probably dressed to appeal to young people. He's advertising, right? He's wearing the, the hip jeans. He's got the untucked shirt. He's got the, maybe he's got the, the, the earring, uh, spike gelled hair. He's got the look right? And uh, they're doing the youth thing. And these kids are totally sold out. They're a generation charged to rescue a generation. Here's how youth groups are branded these days. When you and I were growing up, it was called youth group, right? What time's youth? Eight. Okay. In the bulletins, youth meeting, seven o'clock. Youth on Sunday. Now, now they have very catchy names and brands, just like you would market a product. This is, unless you think this is an American phenomenon, this is actually a church in Queensland, Australia. And they've got a very hip, cool, edgy kind of a look. Well, I went through and found some of the names of uh, youth groups and how they are named and branded, and there are thousands, but I brought some of the most interesting or catchy ones with me today. Names like A2J, Addicted to Jesus. Aftershock, Blaze, Club 316, DOC, the Disciples of Christ, DV8, that's the letters, DV8, edgy. Club 316, DOC, Edge, Elevate, Flipside, Fusion, Generation Now, Ground Zero, H2O, Impact, Lifehouse, MVP, No Limits, 180, Planet Youth, Riot, Radiate, Raw, Real Life, Refuge, Swag. <laughs> Summit, Tsunami, 24-7, U-Turn, Warehouse, Youth Action, Zero Gravity, Zion, and The Zone. 
And they populate their youth groups with stuff to attract young people, not just on Sunday, but during the week. They'll put in video games, sometimes Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo setups. They'll do arcade. They'll pull in pinball machines and fully stand up arcade games. Some uh, churches do indoor cage basketball. Have you guys ever seen, there's a church in Tulsa that did it, I want to say it's Grace Church, did like a half-court indoor cage basketball, it's awesome. I mean, it's like, I think it's Grace, it's, it's like a, um, it's, a ha it's a big cage that's painted black or red, I, I've seen so many I get them confused, and, and you actually go in and you're playing ball, and it's designed as a rec hall, a place for young people, and again, they're wanting to provide an alternative to all the stuff that is worldly, that is involved or, or instigated by Satan. They want environments where kids, young people want to hang out. Here's a youth lounge, lounge in Metro Church, Birmingham, Alabama, just a place to chill out. Maybe you've heard of this church in uh, Lake Forest, California, the church of Pastor Rick Warren. Saddleback Church, check it out. They've got full concert quality lighting and sound, fog, pyrotechnics, full media, video. It's really a show designed to bring people in. We are advertising. We are marketing. Okay. By the way, it was an extremely tragic story. I guess it's been, what, four weeks or so, five weeks, about Rick Warren's son committed suicide. Tremendously. It's just horrifying story, which shows you that even uh, the religious family is not immune to this kind of tragedy. It's, it brings a host of questions, which I will not delve into here. Here's a, a youth conference that happened a couple years ago called Catalyst. Now, youth leaders from all around the USA congregated at this thing to talk about the future of youth ministry. Does that look like any church meeting you've ever been to? Check the, check the video screens in the round. Flying. The only thing missing from this photograph is Aerosmith, right? <laughs> There's a church in my hometown called Guts Church. Now, I have a confession to make. 20 years ago, I played keyboards in the band for Guts Church. I sucked. <laughs> I, I am not gifted in this area. But they were a startup church, and they were going after all the people that regular church didn't want. Right? Church used to say, we want to bring, they were like the Statue of Liberty, bring me your tire, your poor, your huddled masses. What they really meant was, bring me somebody who looks just like me or I'll be uncomfortable. And so what God's church did was they went after all the people that regular church, the First Baptist Church of Hooterville, wasn't going after. They were going after the people with the piercings and the drug addicts and the prostitutes and the, I mean, I'm telling the people, the bikers, I mean, anybody who didn't fit into that at the time, that church cookie cutter, you know, and you could be just someone who looked different or you could be someone who really was different and that's who they wanted. And um, every year, uh, they have, by the way, gone from kind of a niche church to a mainstream, one of the edgy churches, and it's one of the most popular churches of its kind in the Midwest. And every year, they do... A haunted house. Anybody familiar with the Hell House? Right? They, around the month of October, will put together a haunted house, but it's not based in witches and warlocks and ghosts and goblins and Dracula and all those things. No, no. They were presenting what they consider to be real life horrors. They're using this as a way to get people in the community to come through, and then they get to present their message and you get a haunted house experience out of this. Well, they do something called the nightmare every single year. And I will tell you, last time I was through was probably six years ago. It's gotten bigger every year. I know y'all are a bunch of infidels. I would still tell you to pay money and go through it, to see it. it you, you should see it. It is Universal Studios quality. The production values are unbelievable. People are lined up around the building for a month to get into this thing. Now, who's the target? Young people. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the nightmare. And it's usually about the same every year. Uh, they'll enhance it or do a few tweaks. But this is largely what happens. You're walking through and let's say you're in a, um, uh, you walk through a uh, supposed outdoor vista and you see a car that's overturned. It's all banged up, doors jacked open, back wheel is still turning, blood everywhere. And you are taken through in a tour group of between maybe seven and ten. And you look inside and you see the shattered, ripped bodies of teenagers who were drinking. Probably severed limbs, as I recall. It's pretty intense. And um, 
you walk into the next scene and you're in a back alley and it's really dark and all of a sudden a bunch of gangbangers walk out start pushing each other around maybe they even push you around bunch of shouting bunch of chaos all of a sudden boom you hear a pistol go off and there's a spritzer above you that spritzes water but because it's nearly dark in there it feels like you have been just hit with blood spatter from the pistol wound you walk into the next room there's a teenager on the bed she's blowing her brains out and her brains are all over the wall she's laying there and you see the videotape of her suicide playing on a loop on the television set She's lamenting this world and depression or whatever it is that has, that has made her life not worth living. And boom, you see literally the... You walk into the next and the next and the next. And finally, near the end, you see Jesus Christ on the cross. I wish this was in color, but this was from their phone app that they used to uh, pitch the nightmare. His back is to you. Actually, his, yeah, his back's to you. He's like this on the cross and he's writhing and he's obviously in horrible pain. The cross then pivots at its base, 180 degrees, so you see his face. He breathes his last. He drops his head and dies. And then the door opens and you walk out and guess what? There's a whole host of trained counselors in the parking lot waiting to talk to you about what you've just seen. What you've just seen are real because Satan is the prince of this world and you don't want to go to hell. You think this is hell? Wait till the hell uh, that uh, is prepared for the devil and his angels becomes a reality in your life. You don't want this. Say the salvation prayer with us now. Well, God's Church is also involved in some other edgy type marketing to young people. One of them is called Fight Night. It's a boxing match. Kickboxing, as I understand it. I don't know if it's kickboxing or just regular boxing. Now, somebody explain this to me. Jesus says to turn the other cheek, so we put together an event that says kick the shit out of each other for Jesus in the parking lot. But you should have seen it. I mean, they come out and they have... Um, they have the boxing ring, and they have the lights and the sound, and they have all of the bells and whistles. Who's the target? Young people and young adults. Well, they invited one of their guest boxers. His name is George Klingscale. He was a linebacker for Tulsa University, and he went out and boxed the match. When he was over, when the match was over, he staggered off the stage, out of the arena, and within a few hours, George Klingscale was dead. He had not told, nor had they discovered, that he had sickle cell before he went out and, and boxed the match. And there's lawsuits flying everywhere. ESPN did a, uh, a profile on it. If you get a chance, I believe it's on YouTube or it might be on the ESPN site. It's, it's a very good look at what happened. And everybody's suing everybody. Who's at fault? Well, he should have come clean and said he had sickle cell. Oh, wait, wait a minute. They weren't sanctioned by the only organization in the state of Oklahoma authorized to sanction amateur boxing, USA Boxing. It was an un unsanctioned match. It shouldn't have happened. It's their fault. The pastors in the church are being sued. Everybody's blaming everybody. It's been two years, and it's still going on. Nobody's asking the larger question. How did God allow this to happen on His watch? This is a ministry and outreach event. This is where God reaches out to bring in the lost to save souls for eternity. The most critical thing that could ever happen. And in his house, on his watch, George Klingscale died. Now, why didn't God reach down and tap somebody on the shoulder and said, Hey, George has sickle cell. He's not the best candidate to do this. Or better yet, why did God not reach down and miraculously breathe life into the dead body of George Klingscale. Imagine the ministry advertising they would have gotten out of that. It would have been like Mecca. People have been traveling from all over the world to come here to see the place where the miracle happened. Instead, as it always is, people invoke the name of God. But it's a decidedly human event. Back to young children. I'm amazed at the stuff they use to market Jesus and biblical characters to our young people. Anybody remember that He-Man was bad for you? He-Man was of the devil. 
I know Harry Potter's of the devil, Pokemon's of the devil. We did a whole show called Harry Potter's of the devil. If you get an hour, it's fascinating. We talk about how they used to burn all of our rock albums when we were kids, you know. But you play it backwards and it says, Satan? <laughs> well, actually, that was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and the law of averages says occasionally you're going to hear a word, that's a word that sounds like Satan. Well, some of the, uh, the dolls they have that they target young people with are, are Bible-oriented dolls. There's David, there's Noah, there's Moses, and Samson, who look absolutely badass in these photographs, by the way. Now, here's the alternative, I think, the alternative alternative to Barbie, it's God's girls. Sarah and Abigail and Hannah and Sarah. My name means princess. I really am a princess because my father is the king of kings. I love dancing and praising God. Of course, if we're going to price these biblically, they will have to be sold for half of what the male dolls are being sold for. <laughs> Here's the Bible coloring book. Now, if you're going to color these pictures, you want to stock up on crimson because of the nature of most Bible stories. By the way, how many of you like me, and you can, it's okay to admit it, I'll start us, read the Bible your whole life and all of a sudden one day looked down and saw the rivers of blood that had been in front of you in the Old and New, I mean, especially in the Old, and had not noticed them before? What's that about? Is that because they taught us to skip over? Is it because we, were, we didn't care? Is it because they, they only showed us the happy love verses with an occasional mention of hell? You know, how did I miss the story about the Israelites teaching the Benjamites to kidnap women because they decimated their tribe and wanted to help them replenish? So they taught them how to kidnap the women of other tribes to be taken home and raped so that they could have more children. How did I miss that, right? That Israel is the, is the, was literally propagated and promoted and empowered by Yahweh. How did I miss that story? Joshua fought the Je Battle of Jericho. What a beautiful... We, they taught it to us in a song. How did I miss the part where they went in and executed mothers and babies? How did I miss that? They taught it to us as children. And the walls came a-tumbling down. I totally got off the subject, but you guys know how I am. Here's a... Uh, Bible version of Monopoly, it's called Bibleopoly. Presumably with a get out of hell free card. <laughs> One of my favorites is the Noah's Ark playset. Now I suspect that this was created by an atheist because it's self-refuting. You can't fit all the animals on the ark at the same time. <laughs> There's the Jonah and the Whale plush set. Now this one's kind of creepy. I guess to play with it, you have to grab Jonah and cram him in the whale's mouth and zip it shut and like wait three days, unzip it, and then pull him back out. This will cost you $23.99 at BibleToys.com. Here's the Jesus puppet from BiblePuppet.com. Now if this doesn't screw your kid up, I don't know what. <laughs> Again, I suspect atheist involvement, because for Jesus to do anything, it requires a human hand. <laughs> Anybody familiar with this? The Left Behind series. I used to read these books. Uh, well, there's a uh, video game based on the books called Eternal Forces, and it's uh, targeted to young people and even young adults. And in the game, you control a force called the Tribulation Force. They're in New York City right after the rapture. Now, I'm sure you guys are familiar with end times theology, but just let me do due diligence and say that most uh, Protestant Christian churches believe that there will be a second coming of Christ, and they debate on exactly what order these things will happen. But the standard approach is the second coming happens, then Christ raptures up his children, and then Satan is given control of the earth for seven years. Why Satan, uh, Jesus would give control of the planet to his arch enemy for seven years is beyond me, but he does. And then he comes back and he reigns for a thousand years before dispatching Satan permanently. Well, anyway, this is during the, the tribulation. You're out dispatching devils and demons. Check the horns. You're actually doing battle against evil out there. Who's the target? Young people. How would you like your children to sleep under the divine protection of Jesus Christ every night and look like a total idiot? 
It's the armor of God pajamas, complete with the shield of faith that you can tuck your head on every night. Now, I love this one. This is the Jesus action figure. Now, <laughs> Jesus travels with me everywhere. I actually had the cost-benefit discussion when I bought this, because you buy it from a, a Christian organization, right? Is this gag worth the money I'm going to pay to a Christian organization? And of course, absolutely, it's worth the gag. It's been this, I took this down to the American Atheist Convention. It was awesome. And Jesus talks. You just press the button. 1231. There you go. Love others as much as you love yourself. Jesus. There's only I one good way to get him to shut up, and it's like, I want uh, it's just... <laughs> Call down the one true God. <laughs> May you all be touched by his noodly appendage. Oh, yeah. Amen. But you remember the songs they taught us as kids? The B-I-B-L-E, now that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, all those. Father Abraham had many sons. Remember that one? <laughs> Hypocrite. So, uh... It's funny, I had a whole bunch of people singing it in Austin, Texas. I did the same thing. I got them all to sing. I'm like, what are y'all doing? What's the matter with you people? Now, how ingenious is it to teach us these stories and scripture songs when we're very, very young through song? I'm 45, and I still remember it all. Now, does she have any idea what's in that book? Does she have the life experience or maturity or perspective to properly digest what she reads in that book? And yet she's all in. She has absolutely bought it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, or they are weak and he is strong. And they're telling their friends, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves you. They're praying to Jesus. Carrying the Bible around to Sunday school. I did a, um, an interview with a young lady named Andrea Steele in Tampa, Florida. And she is founder of the Free Thought Film Festival, Festival. And she said it better than I ever could. She said, she used to do youth ministry. She said, everything I ever learned about marketing, I learned in church. <laughs> Right? They were advertising to this young girl and she bought the product, hook, line, and sinker, and is now recommending it to her friends. Right? And the uh, edict to target children comes straight from the pages of Scripture. Proverbs 22 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart or turn from it. Maybe you're familiar with the old Jesuit proverb, give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. And churches will tell you specifically. They're desperate to get the kids. There's an organization called Grow Churches. And a couple of children's pastors up in Michigan, Josh and Kate Richter, actually said this. Children come to us with the ability to be built up in their beliefs, to be guided and directed with a sort of ease that is only apparent in children. We believe this is all part of God's plan. Children are the smooth, liquid concrete that can take on the shape it needs to before hardening. We have a very limited time in a person's life to help form their very foundation. You go to a seven-year-old and you tell them that the earth was once covered in water and a man captained a floating zoo filled with hamsters and penguins and camels and velociraptors <laughs> so that he could then dock in a place where the ark would never be found so that he and seven other people could practice incest to repopulate the earth in only 4,000 years. You tell a young child that, what do they say to a trusting parent or a pastor or Sunday school teacher? Wow! What a miracle! You tell that to somebody who had first heard the story at the age of 20 and they will just laugh you out of the room. Get out of my face. What are you smoking? You know? 
Get them early. Get them young. Make, them, make this their normal. The Barna Group is an organization that does uh, statistics for ministries all across the country and I believe around the world. And they did an article recently called Evangelism is Most Effective Among Kids. The current Barna study indicates that nearly half of all Americans who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior do so before the reaching the age of 13. And that two out of three born-again Christians made that commitment to Christ before their 18th birthday. Get them early. Get them while they're young. Get them before they've had an opportunity to be properly exposed to all of the other information out there. Get them while they're young. And of course, I'm a product of private Christian school. I was in third grade at public school and I started coming home to my mother and I write about this in the book. I started coming home and tell, telling my parents what I had learned about Neanderthal man. The stuff that's not in the Bible, you know, cavemen and all that. And they picked us up and they dropped us down in private school. They didn't even want us exposed to these ideas. And Temple Christian School was a tiny church-owned private school. The uniforms were, and I kid you not, red, white, or blue slacks, red, white, or blue shirt, and on Wednesdays, which was chapel day, and chapel's a church service, you had to wear a red, white, or blue clip-on necktie with little American flags all over it. We prayed before our lesson plans. We, pray, we prayed before lunch on chapel Wednesdays. They would walk us all into the auditorium and we'd have a church service. It would be a, we'd have a teacher, pastor, we'd have music, we'd have a, some kind of a drama. It was all very church oriented. And before we started, we would say our pledges. And we didn't just say the pledge to the American flag. Afterwards, we stood and said our pledge to the Christian flag. Christian flag is a white flag with a blue square and a red cross. We would stand up. I was in fourth grade. Stand up. Hand over your heart and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again to give life and liberty to all who believe. It has been almost three decades. Actually, it's been more than three decades, and I still remember every syllable. Tell me this is not a powerful way to indoctrinate the young. We still weren't done. We had to say our pledge to the Bible. They'd bring a student out, we'd hold the Bible out, one hand under, one hand over. All of us would put our hand over our hearts. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word. I will make it a lamp into my feet and a light into my path and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. I'm in fourth grade. Do I have any idea what an allegiance is? How do I process that? I pledge allegiance to the Bible. I will make it a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I will hide its words in my heart so that I might not sin against God. I'm pledging my lifelong allegiance to this book, to this theology, to this doctrine, to this way of living. Period. I think about it now and it just makes me livid. Some of these kids, I look at them and think they never had a chance. Because they grow up in a, in a culture where everybody around them looks like them, talks like them, goes to a church like them. They're never challenged. I was 37 years old before I heard the name of Richard Dawkins or read the work of Daniel Dennett or knew who Sam Harris was before I genuinely took a, a, an objective look at Carl Sagan. We used to make fun of Sagan when I was a kid. Billions and billions. I mean, that was an easy punchline. <laughs> That's all we knew, right? And while I'm busy mocking him as a child, I miss one of the most groundbreaking landmark television experiences based on a landmark book ever. I, I fell in love with Carl Sagan. I tell you, it, he was dead for years before I really discovered him. And then I looked at him and I thought, well, why was I shuffled off in the other direction? Why wasn't, he was passionate about learning. He was passionate about, about exploring. And when he made mistakes, he came forward and admitted it and he moved on. 
improved his argument? How come, I, how come he was the bad guy? Well, now it's not content. Uh, the movement is not content to go after children in private schools. Now they're going after it, uh, children, of course, in public schools. Are you guys facing this here in the state of Arkansas? Oklahoma, we've got Burkeen. Um, he believes that evolution is a religion, uh, which boggles the mind. Um, I know that they're dealing, uh, talking to Aaron Raw and Matt Dillahunty down in Texas. They're, good. they're always doing battle down there, you know, Texas State Board of Education. And they're going out, they're wanting to affect the curriculum. Did you guys hear about that uh, uh, school in Louisiana that's teaching in a private Christian school textbook that the Loch Ness Monster is real? And that it is a plesiosaur. And you think, and you look at these kids who will never be challenged, who will never actually talk to like a Donald Prothero or a, a you know a paleontologist, who can say, hey, hey, danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> you know, you, let me show you what the evidence says. No, they're going to grow up believing this stuff, and it's going to take a lot to get them out. And of course, there's all of these bills. I just screenshotted some of them that are going on in states like uh, Indiana and Missouri and and all around the country, Colorado, Montana. I interviewed Catherine Stewart on one of my uh, podcasts a while back. She's an author of a book called The Good News Club, The Christian Right Stealth Assault on America's Children. Now, she did an interview with Bloomberg last year, and she quoted Matthew Staver. He's the founder and chairman of Liberty Council, which is one of the big legal bigwigs behind the Child Evangelism Fellowship, behind the Good News Club. And this guy said this, if you want to change the face of the planet, you want to focus on those children ages 5 through 12. It is the most strategic age group that we have. Knock down all of the doors, all of the barriers to all of the 65,000 plus elementary schools in the country and take the gospel to this open mission field now. Not later, now. And of course, in my opinion, no discussion of childhood indoctrination is complete without a mention of the 2006 documentary film, Jesus Camp. I brought a clip with me today. Hallelujah. I need you to get serious, serious with God. Say, God, God. I'm here to be trained. I'm here for an education. I'm willing, God. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't open your mouth, the Holy Spirit can't talk. All right, now I want everyone to raise your hands and we're going to pray in tongues. Hallelujah, let's do it. Oh, we love you, Jesus. So, Kohor Rashada Kahala Busida. Lord Rashada Kahala Busida. Let the Holy Spirit fall. He's here. Feel his power. Feel his power. See him, you talk to And the Holy Spirit is just going to whisper in your ear what to say. You have the answer. This is child abuse. I grew up in a little, uh, I, it wasn't in the country, but it was actually a little kind of little country Pentecostal church. And this kind of thing was like every Sunday. The kids normally didn't participate. The kids were looking around going, what the hell's going on? <laughs> but the adults were praying in tongues. I remember my mother actually said to me, it's all right, son. It's all right. It's in the Bible. No, don't be scared. Don't be scared. And of course, my natural inclination was, this is, what's going on? This is crazy. Uh, maybe sometimes kids are smarter than we give them credit for. Um, I remember there was a, uh, a youth summer camp where they divided the auditorium. And in, in church summer camp, those of you who have been can vouch for me on this one. You don't just go and do summer camp stuff. It's actually church. You have church in the morning, you have church midday, and you have church in the evening, right? I see a nod. You're like, yes, I've been there. I endured it. Okay. And you, you have church. Well, that's what, in five days a week, you have church. And they divided the 
group of young people into this half of the auditorium and this half. This half, they say, you guys are not saved, right? You guys are going to play the, the unsaved masses. You guys are all Christians. It is on you to help these people accept Jesus Christ. You need to convince them that it is on them, that they need to give their lives to Jesus. 30 minutes. On your mark, get set, go. And these kids, I mean, you should have seen them. Now, it's an exercise, but there were very real tears and pleadings, and this group of people was essentially given the burden of saving the souls of everybody else, because if not, they were going to go to hell. And I think to myself, what a horrible disservice we do to our young people. Well, I wanted to present the argument about how, and this is a hot button with me, I'll admit it. I mean, I came from a devoutly Christian home and Christian church and Christian school, and we were never given the choice. And I'm a little pissed off about it <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm making up for lost time. I, I see kids who are in these cocoons, these biospheres, who are, who are being taught non-science. Or, or pseudoscience, or false science, or, or false history, or, or even a false morality. And I just, I just get livid. And I think, I'm going to, you know, in some ways, I don't believe that we should be out there beating people over the head with a stick. But at the same time, I think I'd like to be heard. I'd like someone to know that there's someone else out there who's holding up a hand that says, you may want to check your facts on this one, you know? I've been down the road, you're traveling. Just don't take my word for it. That's the last thing I want you to do. Check the facts. Go to the library. Google is your friend. <laughs> Young people today are twice as likely, people under the age of 30 are twice as likely as they were today, as they were in 1990, to declare themselves as non-religious. That's not necessarily atheist, but non-religious. Yeah. yeah, we just, come on. They, they're focused on other things. They want other things. I think that is largely due to the internet. Because now if someone comes forward and says the earth, Ken Ham says that the earth is 6,000 years old, you can check it in about 30 seconds. You know? If someone comes to you and they tell you that the Grand Canyon was formed in five minutes during the Great Flood, you can check it. If someone comes forward and tells you that they are speaking with absolute truth, that the world is going to end. We did a whole show on end of the world predictions. How many thousands of them have there been? And everybody's wrong. All it takes is a, a quick search. You can check them out. Information? Why do you think information is so dangerous to people? <laughs> because, hey, if they can't take your word for it, maybe they'll start thinking for themselves. And we wouldn't want that. Well, I did a video on the targeting of young people that framed this situation in a very unusual way, in, in my opinion. And I, it, I believe it is doctrinally sound. It, it uh, reflects the Protestant churches that I was raised in and around the teaching to children. And yet it phrases it in a unique way that I think draws a circle around some of the greater damage that we're doing. With your approval, I'd like to show it to you now. I call it, Welcome to This World. Hello, my child. Welcome to this world. Before you grow up, there are a few things I need to tell you. You were born worthless, void, corrupt. You were born a sinner, and the wages of sin is death. Someday, when you are old enough to understand, you must ask forgiveness. Not for anything you've done, but for what others did thousands of years ago at the beginning of the world. Also, you must tell God how sorry you are for murdering his son Jesus. I know, it 
happen generations before you drew your first breath. And it was ultimately part of God's divine plan, but the responsibility is yours. You are guilty, and you must ask to be forgiven. A portion of everything you produce in your lifetime must be given to God, who will never accept your offerings personally. You will listen for him, but his voice will never be heard audibly. You will thank him for his direction and guidance, but his mysterious ways will confuse you. In fact, although you are more important to God than anything else in the universe, he will never show you his face or reveal himself in any provable way. I know this seems strange. To truly know God, you must study a book, an ancient book, written thousands of years ago in a language you do not understand. You must fulfill a great commission to make others see the world as you do, to have them believe as you do, to live as you do, and then to go out and convince even more to do the same. As a reward for this, you will be given the privilege of praising God without end for all eternity in a hidden happy place that can only be seen by the dead. You must pledge your entire life on this earth to your invisible father and his great commission, or he will send you to a dark pit where the flesh is roasted from your bones and you writhe in unimaginable agony forever and ever and ever. But you must not do this because you fear horrible torture and pain. You must do it because you love God. No matter what happens throughout your lifetime, the more your world seems to defy everything I've taught you here, just continue to say the words out loud. God is real. God is good. And one day, you will look into the eyes of your own child and you'll teach him these very same things so that he can someday teach his own children and their children and their children for generations. You'll hold him in your arms and you'll look down at him and say, Welcome to this world. It's funny, I had a couple of uh, believers watch the video and they said, great video. <laughs> I mean, to them it was like they, they didn't know who I was or didn't know, what, you know who the organization was. And they were like, go out there and get those young people. You know, I mean, it was, that, that was the mentality. Um, you know, I, I want to live in a world where curiosity is not snuffed out when somebody's young, but we sort of ignite the fires of imagination and, and give them the keys to be able to go out and discover stuff. In fact, I want a child who will go out and discover the world and come back and maybe teach me something. Really, what'd you learn? Wow, show me what you got. Let me look at what I think and what, I, well, what, I, uh, what my worldview is and make sure it measures up. Let's talk. Let's challenge each other. Let's learn. Let's, let's observe the world. I, you know, I want a young person who hasn't been indoctrinated to fear hell. You should see my email inbox. I have nightmares. I can't sleep. I feel like logically I, I'm in the right place, but I'm afraid to go to hell. What am I going to do? I wake up in cold sweat. I mean, I'm, I'm not making it up. They, I met a guy in Springfield, Missouri, we did a deal, and he said, I, I, what do I do? We did a Q&A, and he said, what do I do? I, I have, he didn't say night terrors, but essentially he wakes up and he's, he's, he's afraid. Well, where did that begin? Here. I want to see a child who is hungry to explore the world and to, uh, to think bigger than I do to be more than I am. And I'm convinced, my friends, I'm convinced that if we can free the hearts and minds and imaginations of the youngest and most vulnerable among us, 
then in many ways we will also free ourselves. And if we do it right, these young people will grow up to have a personal relationship with reality. <laughs> That's all I have today. Thank you very, very much for having me. How are you guys doing? I didn't see any dozing or snoozing or, or nobody's playing Candy Crush on their phones. Do you guys have a few moments for some dialogue together? I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about all this or anything else that's going on. We have some time for questions, but you need a microphone to ask the question. Um, I think a lot of us feel like you do that uh, propagandizing children with religion is child abuse. I also don't see any practical way around it. Do you? Any practical? Is there no practical to, way? To, to stop parents from propagandizing children with religion. Well, it's a catch-22, isn't it? You can't parent the child for them, mm -hmm. right? We live in a free country. It's like I was talking to uh, was it Natalie and I were talking about free speech the other day and having just kind of a philosophical discussion about. And you know, a free speech is going to protect the best of us. It must also protect the worst. I mean, we have to protect the speech of the Ku Klux Klan, right? In order for the First Amendment to work, it has to work for the best and the worst. And I look at parents indoctrinating their children. Well, in a free country, they, they have the right to raise their children. At the same time, if I look at these children and I think they're never exposed to a, a differing world view or point of view or science or history or information. What do the rest of us do? In my own mind, the best I've come up with is this. I want to be seen and heard in the zip code that these kids are growing up in. You know? uh, and I think yeah, there's not much you can do when they take the TV out of the living room and they don't give them the internet and they don't let them play with anyone. They don't let them go to, they homeschool them, right? They're bringing them and they're building a brick wall. There's not a whole lot we can do there. But I do know that there are a lot of people who, you're not telling them what to think, but if they look out and they see somebody else who has a different point of view, they go, hey, wait a minute, I've never heard that before. And then you never know. I do get a lot of correspondence from teenagers from religious families and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do. I'm not sure I buy all the stuff my parents are telling me. Now that's an odd position for me to be in, right? I've got a young person who's dropping me an email. Well, what, what are my boundaries? What am I supposed to say or do? And I usually say, you know, you are under the guardianship and authority of your mother and father and they need to be respected. At the same time, even if you're in church every day, Use this time to get information because good decisions come from good information. If you have to go to church, fine. Learn the Bible. Learn what your church is teaching. Learn what other churches are teaching. Sponge up information as best you can. There will come a day when you are making life decisions on your own and you will have then been able to use this time to develop the arsenal you need for battle. And then you can determine what you want to stand for and what you uh, accept as, as being based on the evidence and what you accept as moral and you can you can carve your own path and until then you know you are a child under the authority of your mother and father respect them be the best kid you can and be a sponge that's about the best I've come up with I don't know if anyone has a better uh, perspective on that I welcome it because it's a it's a minefield for me and I, I, I navigate it carefully Anybody else? I see a hand in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if, because it was my experience and a lot of others and even this child, <clears throat> where you didn't read the Bible really and you got the gooey stories and whatever. If our public schools actually taught religious stories as literary educational kinds of things would the young people get the bigger story that's in there with all the gore and all the other things not promoting it as religion and not necessarily just Christianity but you know um, the st what each of these religions is saying as a contrast to science instead of I'm just wondering you know I'm really a strong church-state separation but I think this is like literacy would help 
in a way. Well, I don't think teaching the tenets of scriptures, well, here's who they are and what they believe, is a violation of church state. Because what you're doing is teaching the information. You're not saying this is truth. You're saying, well, look, here's Christianity. Here's their deity. Here's their holy book. Here's their basic doctrinal statement. Here are the variations of Christianity. Here's what they believe. Here's Islam. Here's their deity. Here's their holy book. Here's their basic tenets. Here's their church. Here's how they worship. I agree with Daniel Dennett. I believe that the major religions should be taught. Not as this is what to believe or this is truth, but here's what they are and here's what they believe. I believe you're dead on. Teach them Christianity. Teach them Islam. Teach them the Eastern religions. Teach them all of these things as religions that are practiced in this world so that they can be knowledgeable about them. And I think, again, good decisions coming from good information. Imagine if someone looks and says, hey, wait a minute. It's like I use the Mexican food analogy. Anybody here like Mexican food as much as I do? Um, look, you go to a Mexican restaurant and you order a taco. Give me a taco. Well, what's made of, what's a taco? What's well, an enchilada or a tortilla? Lettuce, cheese, salsa, tomato, uh, maybe ground beef. Give me an enchilada. Well, what's in an enchilada? Well, tortilla, lettuce, cheese, salsa, ground beef. Give me a tostada. What's in a tortilla, lettuce, <laughs> salt, right? They mix them up in different ways. This is religion. It's, it's a great analogy, right? You've got your deity, you've got your paradise, you've got your pain. You've got your mission statements, you've got your holy book, you've got your temple, you've got your great commission. Largely, the major religions are like that. I think if people saw the, the religions side by side, they'd go, hmm, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it wouldn't have been spoon-fed to them. It would have been something where they had the information and they connected the puzzle pieces themselves. Brilliant idea. I think it should be mandatory in all public schools that they teach the major tenets of all religions as here's what they believe and how they practice. Anybody else? Oh, forget. Yeah. I, the romantic in me would like to see him go even deeper. This is the Noah's Ark story. There's a man who builds a boat with a single window and God floods the earth and then expresses kind of a remorse. All the animals are on the, the ark. By the way, did you read in the earlier Sumerian account of the epic of Gilgamesh, of the main character, and the gods were unhappy with how noisy the earth had become, so they decided to drown the planet, and so they gave this guy a commission to build a boat with a single door, and he filled it with all a sample of all the world's animals and plants, and then the, the gods felt remorse. I'd like to see those kinds of things shown parallel to each other. That would be beautiful. Anybody else? Yeah, so I agree that it would be ideal if you know, kids could learn about comparative religion, religious, you know, history and all, and all that, but on a practical level, do we trust the uh, Texas Board of Education to do that in a fair way? Well, I think it's, it's like, what are Aaron and what are all the parents down there who are fighting this fight in Texas doing? Well, they're keeping the schools accountable. I mean, there is a system of checks and balances. Now, is it perfect? No. Are there people who are deeply religious who are trying to essentially evangelize the, the school system and the political system, right? We're, one, we're a nation founded by Christians for Christians. You guys heard that one? Wrong. They didn't teach us that when we were growing up. We were charged to go up. In fact, they told us in private Christian school, look, we need good moral Christian men and women who can, who can teach in our schools, who can run for public office, who can help instigate change, who can go out and bring this nation back for Jesus. Satan's taken over. We need to rescue a nation for Jesus. After all, we are one nation under God. Now, of course, we were in a little biosphere and didn't go any different to discover that many of our founding fathers did not hold to the Christian religion at all. Benjamin Franklin, hello? Hello? Benjamin Franklin! They preached it to him like he was, he was near saint. And he didn't hold to Christ or Christianity. He's the one who said lighthouses are more useful than churches. Was it John Adams in the Treaty of Tripoli? Right? The U.S. government is in no sense founded on the Christian religion. They didn't teach us that at Temple Christian School. Um, 
But I think we're going to have to remain the checks and balances for the school system. And sometimes I think having these fights makes us unpopular. That's tough, right? Look, who wants to... You see the little children going into church. Here's a great example. They go into church. And they're smiling ear to ear. They're happy. You bring them in. They have life purpose. They don't fear death. They're going to go to heaven. They have a mission. They have all... They have... They are in a good place. They're happy. For you and me to raise up a hand and say, this is morally wrong. <laughs> it's not a popularity contest winner, is it? Right? But for me, I approach it like this. It's not, does it make me happy? It's, is it supported by the evidence? Is it true? Truth is not a democracy. Truth isn't what I choose because it makes me happy. It's either true or it's not. Well, look, we can debate the deist God. Is there a prime mover, a first cause? Knock yourself out. But we know for sure the Abrahamic God is not true. We know. Because the scriptures that he's based on have been long debunked. We know it's a falsehood. It is false. Do we not, right or wrong, or, or uh, popular or unpopular, do we not have an obligation to hold up a hand and go, wait a minute. You cannot teach this as fact. It has been debunked. Here's the evidence. You, it is immoral to do this to children. And I think we're going to occasionally have to we're going to have to stand on principle, even if it means losing the occasional pop popularity contest, to try to make sure that good information is supported and false information is debunked in the arena of ideas. It's a tough one, especially here in Arkansas. I'm sure you guys feel it. Does anybody here feel... Uh, you don't even have to raise your hand if you're not comfortable. Do you feel nervous that being a non-believer in God will affect you negatively in your job? Or... Yeah? Right? If, if, you, if you had a worldview that was almost anything else, you wouldn't have that worry. Ah, oh, whatever. People are, the people are people. Oh, he's an atheist? You know what? We're not going there. You know what? I'm going to pull my business. You know what? Our kids aren't going to play with your kids. Holy shit. Uh, did you guys read that story? Uh, the study from, was it 2009 that said... Um, the Harris study that said that, uh, no, 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 it was, it was University of Oregon that said that atheists are trusted less than rapists. How, how does that happen? You all seem like good people to me, right? Good moral people, loving people, you love to laugh, you embrace life, you're, you would, you'd help somebody across the street, you would, you're going to help a guy shovel snow, you guys can get snow here, right, out of their driveway. You guys care about, about making the world a better place. You are good, loving, moral human beings. How in the world did you get painted as less trustworthy than a rapist? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. The people who painted you with that brush went unanswered and unchecked. And you and I did not yet have the platform to be able to hold up a hand and say, hey, wait a minute, this is wrong. You are wrong. You are demonstrably wrong. I uh, was at a... Uh, a line I put up on the, uh, the Facebook page or something. We're free thinkers because we believe in living a truthful life. We're activists because we're ready to fight for it. That's how I feel. I'm, I, my life could be a hell of a lot easier if I wasn't an atheist, trust me. But I want to live a truthful life. And you know what? I'm an activist because I think it's worth fighting for. Sure. Anybody else? Yes. Hey, Seth, I'm kind of short and I'm in the back, so I'm going to stand. You're not short. I'm no, not <laughs> terribly short, trust me. Uh, um, the topic of your talk was really resonating with me today. Um, I had an experience. We were watching the, the, the video clip that you made uh, with the children uh, at Jesus Camp, I guess. I, I had an experience like this really recently with my own daughter. Um, my ex-wife and I divorced a couple of years ago. She has custody. And right after the, the uh, Easter service this year, I get a phone call. Hey, guess what? Your daughter's decided to get baptized. I'm thinking, wow, okay. So <laughs> now we've got to have this really awkward conversation about this. And so I started asking questions. You know, okay, well, has she really? She's dying. Like, has she really thought this through? You know, has she, has she really read the Bible to the, the point that she could understand this? No, none of that's happened. Okay, well, is she having classes or something? Is there some sort of, you know, catechism type thing, you know, happening at the church? No, none of that. Is she going to meet with anybody? No. 
I start thinking like, wow, I really object to this, you know, as a parent, that my kid is going to get so deeply involved in this. And I come from a really religious background, and I know how that can uh, impact your life. And uh, we were standing there. I, I went ahead. I'm like, okay, I, I bit my tongue. We attend the service. First time I'm in church for quite a while. And as we're all standing around the baptistry, and my daughter's like in the water, the minister's there, you know, with her, and he's, he's saying the preparatory words before he's going to put her in the water. I'm, I'm just kind of picturing this scene like in a... a like in a marriage or something where the, you know, the minister turns to the audience and says, if anyone here has no. something, you know what I mean? I picture him like, wow, what would that be like, you know? If I want to snatch her out of the water, because it's what I felt like. You know, I wanted to say, no, I, I am a parent too. I object to this. This is against what I believe. And I was just curious, you know, what your thoughts on that might be, about, about the role of an atheist parent and, you know, a... Uh, a Christian parent and how you deal with issues like that because my views just weren't hurt. So I'm just curious about your feedback well, on that. I must, I have to be honest, I, I don't have children. I, I, um, I, I, know, I, I enjoy kids, but when I was married, I, children were never really the desire of our heart. You know, we were always career people and we always decided that we would not be, have children because we were culturally told to have children. We wanted to be the desire of our heart and that day just never came. Uh, I have, oh, Natalie and I are talking marriage here, so we're about to become a stepdad with two amazing teenagers. And, and um, But I, I'm probably not the best qualified to speak to parenthood. I, I can speak to, from an outside in, I can tell you that I, I get a lot of correspondence from, from mixed relationships. Uh, he's a believer, she's not, or vice versa, and there are kids in the middle being tugged at left and right. And... Uh, I honestly think it's doable. I think it's extremely difficult, but I think a, a few things have to happen. I, I, th I think you don't... There's always going to be bias, right? If you're raising a child, there's always going to be bias. If you're telling them a story about the Bible and you're a non-believer, you're going to be like, by the way, this is a bunch of bullshit. But anyway, and if you're, not, if you're a believer, you're going to be, this is an amazing story. You're going to love the story about Moses, right? I mean, that's going to have human nature. There's bias everywhere we are. But I think, if it was me, the best I could do is to say, I can't tell you what to believe. Let me tell you what I believe. Let your mother, we'll t she'll tell you what she believes. And I want you to know that I love her and I respect her ability to desire to live however she chooses. It's a free country and she's a wonderful person and I respect her right to do that. I don't agree with her in this. She does not agree with this and me in this. She respects my right to be a non-believer. She respects me as a person. This is kind of a tough divide between us. We can't tell you what to believe. But you know what? Learn about it. Learn about the world. Go to church and learn about church. As long as they're not pounding the indictment, as long as they're watching, you know, and they're not being, it's not fear pimping the children kind of a thing. Uh, in that instance, in that near utopian instance, I think it is very doable, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time I see kids are torn right in the middle. The mother or the father, whoever the believer is, is like, I gotta rescue these kids at all costs. I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want them to be a bad person. And the other guy's going, God, what in the world am I gonna do? They're they're indoctrinating my kid with stories of a of an earth younger than the Sumerian civilization. What am I gonna do? You know. Um, if the two parents respect each other enough to be able to not denigrate each other in front of the child and to teach the children how to think instead of what to think, it's I think it's possible. But it's probably going to be the exception more than the rule. I don't know. Forgive me for, for looking from the outside in, but if someone else has more wisdom on the subject, I would defer to you. Um, I was just going to mention that we are starting a family group, a uh, family freethinker group, so you might uh, look on Meetup to get more information on that. And there's also a website called Parenting Beyond Belief that has a lot of really good information. These two young women over here, <laughs> stand up so they can see you. <laughs> Jessica and uh, Rhonda. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Rosemary and Sue, no. <laughs> anyway, they're gonna they're in charge of the family group and they're and one Jessica is also a blogger on Parenting Beyond Belief, aren't you? On their website. So they have some good information about family stuff too. So, but the Parenting Beyond Belief has really good information. 
Geez, I could have just kept my mouth shut and you could have just spent them over there. I'm sorry. No, you gave some really good advice. Think for yourself. Teach them to think for yourself, not what to think. Look, I'm not Yoda. You know, I'm just a video producer, an ex, an ex Christian broadcaster. I'm a storyteller. I'm a communicator. I'd like to say I'm an encourager. You know, when I look around and I feel so ill qualified when I look at some of the PhD types who are part of this movement, right? They, I was in Denver, Victor Stinger on, is on stage. I'm like, the guy's like a genius. Uh, Lawrence Krauss is speaking in a month at the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention. I'm speaking right before him. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes I find myself apologizing, but I, I talk myself out of apologizing too much because I think we're in a movement that needs encouragers and storytellers. And, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a theoretical physicist. I'm not a great philosopher. I'm, I'm a guy who can tell you what the inside of the church is like and, and who can articulate in radio and video why I think it needs to be spoken out against. And... Uh, I think we all probably play to our gifts in whatever way we can, right? Whatever you got is what you do. And uh, this is just sort of my way to, to, play to play to a gift, hoping to make a difference. Yes, was there someone in the back? I just uh, kind of wanted to tell me your name again. Um, I can really relate to your experience on several levels because, um, one, I had that baptism experience at 17, that ex exact experience, and uh, my husband and I share joint custody of uh, my three and five year old with their Christian dad. So, and he takes them to church every Sunday and my five year old has had a lot of questions and um, he's actually become really upset if I've told him that I don't believe in God and I, you know, I had to tell him that it's okay to believe whatever you want to believe and it doesn't make you a good or bad person and encourage him to think critically about everything and everything and I get so annoyed with his why 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 but that's what we really want is to encourage him to to think broadly and always question authority and make that kind of a rule of the household and um, I've told him that you know if you don't if you want to believe in God and you want to say a prayer at dinner I'm not going to stop you from doing that but everyone has, um, that's kind of a great thing about living in the United States is we have the freedom to believe whatever we want. And that's something that I'll strongly advocate for. So I'd be happy to talk more about that. And uh, Rhonda and I starting the Family Freethinkers group. We have a um, picnic July 2nd, 2nd from 10 a.m. to 2? 10 to 1 at Burns Park. So it's on the... It's on, um, it's on the Meetup page, it's on the Facebook page, and I'm uh, happy, Rhonda, I would be happy to talk to you about it. By the way, I did a, uh, a radio podcast. Mm -hmm. I, is, how's the fidget factor? I figure we'll go a few more and then let everybody go. I, I want to make sure I respect your time. Um, I did an interview uh, podcast conversation with a, a, a Methodist minister. His name is Bob. And if you're looking for a way to sort of help introduce other people who don't get you into wh how you got where you are. Bob and I had just a chat and it's uh, not a beat him over the head kind of a thing. We laugh, we relate, we have fun, we're friends and friendly, but we challenge each other. And I think it's sort of an echo of some of the challenging that's going on maybe in your own circles. And if you have people who don't get you, I've had, I'm not slugging the book. I promise this happened. Someone said, uh, my mother did not really understand me. I gave her, because my book is sort of a journey of my own, uh, story of my own journey. I, I gave this and said, look, this is a lot like me. I came from the Protestant Christian Midwest. I, this, this is it. it. It's not insulting to believers. It's, it just, it just kind of tells you how I got there. And uh, so I think if, if you can get people sort of listening in, it's funny how people sort of listen in from the cheap seats, and all of a sudden they step in a little further to listen, and then they step a little further in before you know it, you know, at least they're challenged. And if they stick with what they believe, at least they didn't do so because there were no other alternatives. They did it because, hey, this was the most sound argument in my opinion, and I'm going to keep it. Anybody else? Yeah, I had a, a, a thing to throw at you, a story about something that happened here in the city, but while I was going to do that, when this gentleman stood up, I'm in a very similar situation as well, and I just wanted to throw a small bit of support. I have three children, you know, and, and their mother is a believer and takes them to church, one's five and nine, and I've never said, you know, hey, I don't, you know, it's all bullshit, blah, 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 you know, I haven't had that conversation, but 
the way that I've dealt with it so far at, at our house is I just simply say, how do you know what's real in this world? How can you, how do you know if there's a boogeyman? How do you know if there's a monster under your closet? You know, how, you, what can you do? Well, I can go look at it. You know, I can see it, feel it, touch it, measure it, taste it. If you can't do those things, it's not real. Then it's just an emotion. It's a feeling. It's a thought. It's a belief, if you will. So those are the conversations I've had with my children. I've never said, I don't believe in God or whatever. And they asked me, I said, well... I don't know. Have you ever seen God? Uh, no, I, you know, I haven't. Well, have you ever seen the Care Bears? Well, no on TV. Okay. Well, you know, then you can decide what's real for yourself and you can decide what you want to think, but use that formula and, and, and figure it out. And recently my nine-year-old, you know, comes to my wife and it's like, I don't, don't, daddy doesn't believe in God, I don't think, because he says he only believes in what's real. It's like, well, you answered your own question, <laughs> you know? So I, I haven't, and, and I've had a, you know, online conversations, you know, uh, so to speak, anonymously with people. And of course, the adamant believers are like, oh, well, you're, you're telling your kid what to believe. How dare you? It's like, no, it's actually the fucking opposite. I told them how to think and said, hey, think for yourself and, you know, look at the facts, find the evidence, and whatever the subject may be, whether it's what's good food, where's a good restaurant to eat, if there's an invisible space alien floating around out there that loves us and hates us at the same time, whatever the idea is, Figure it out for yourself and, and use logic, reason, and evidence to support that. And that will guide you, whatever you might come up with. And my nine-year-old, oh, well, obviously that's not, you know, what he thinks, you know. So for what that's worth, that might also throw that out. I don't know. I didn't want to waste if your time. If I can time, jump in real quick, it's funny. One, I was in a conversation, I'll, and I'll say something like, that's a nice car you're driving. What is it? Well, it's a Ford F-150 or whatever. Really? Why this one? Well, it's funny. I went to about 10 different dealerships, right? And I went to Blue Book and went online, looked at the history, and then I went to Consumer Reports and I looked over here and I found out, well, it's got this kind of gas mileage and it's done this, but at least it's made here in the USA and it's done this. And they know everything about the vehicle, right? They did weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of research and challenge, even, even arguing with the salesman to get the price down before they bought into the car. But they can't tell you who wrote the book of Genesis. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Right? Who, brought, who wrote the book of Exodus? But they know it's true. It's amazing how people are, they're skeptics in many, many, many other areas. Where are we going to send our kids to school? We need to vet these schools to make sure that they have the proper curriculum and that they're going to do this. And how are, are, the, are the teachers vetted? And is it a good, is it a reputable? Is it going to do this? Is it going to do that? What, how's crime in the area? Is it near, a, is it near a, a dangerous place? They'll do all this homework. Who wrote the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? <laughs> Well, I think we're, we're trained to be lazy in this way from a very young age. I'm sorry, Joey, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think I, maybe I'd sent you a link to the story, but a few weeks ago in a town here in Arkansas, a little small nugget of a town in northeast Arkansas, Lake City, uh, they actually were having a, uh, a kindergarten or elementary style graduation ceremony, uh, sixth grade, yeah. And they uh, basically, part of the official schedule of the public school ceremony was they were going to have a opening prayer thing. And, now, and let me stop. Let, was it a prayer to the Christian God? Right? Yes. Okay. All right. And and supported by a local Christian church. Well, a one parent who was of secular mind basically, you know, you really can't do that. That's not acceptable as part of an official procedure in a public school, blah, blah, blah. I protest that being part of the official thing. You know, if somebody wants to go over there in the corner and pray or whatever, that's their right. But it can't be an official thing. That's whatever. And the school wound up shutting the whole graduation down. They just canceled the whole thing. And then they put out, well, we canceled it because somebody protested the prayer. And of course, Arkansas, it's hellfire and brimstone. They're burning the lady's house down because she's Satan. You lost blah, the popularity blah, blah. contest, right? She did, you know, and, and even there's a lot of online debate of it, you know, whatever, whatever. But, you know, the reality is if we're going to have a prayer to God, all right, well, let's stand up and let's line up the thousands of gods and pray to them. How long is that going to take, you know? So anyway, there's, that was uh, an example of public ran school throwing in you know, the, the religion. And There's something creepy. romantic about the, the, when you speak about it ahead of time, 
the prayer, the invocation. There's something romantic sort of about it. We're all going to bow our heads in reverence and we're going to thank God for this day and for our children and for what they're going to. Has anyone heard anything more mind-numbingly dull than a graduation invocation? <laughs> right? But it's about the thought of doing it. Well, he's right. I mean, pray beforehand. Pray with your family before and after. Wear a Jesus t-shirt and be in the audience. But a state-run school cannot be in the business of promoting a specific religion. And if you and I hold up our hands, we are going to lose the popularity contest. Does it mean we shouldn't hold up our hands? Sometimes I think, well, you've got to choose your battles, sure. Sometimes I think it's not about what's popular. When did right become popular or unpopular? It's right. This is the Constitution. This is the letter of the law. This is the intent of the Founding Fathers. Why does Christianity get a pass? And then whenever you say something about it, they play victim and you're less trusted than a rapist. It's a catch-22. This is their way of saying, shut up. Don't challenge us. Let us do what we want. Now, we're not going to pray to Allah. We're not going to pray to Krishna. We're not going to pray to whoever. No, we're going to pray to Yahweh, our God. That's who we have freedom for religion for. Do you think they would have been as vehement about all this had the prayer had been to the God of Islam? They'd have freaked. It's not about freedom of religion. It's about circling the wagons and building a hedge of protection around a cherished worldview. And if you come after me, I'm going to say you are responsible for the reason that we, we can't. It's your fault, you less than rapist, atheist, infidel people. It, look, it, it's, in the arena of ideas, sometimes we, we have, public perception does matter sometimes. You know, there are some fights that Silverman takes on that I'll think. Sometimes I think, yeah. Sometimes I think, ugh. Is this the best use of our resources? I don't know. I mean, that's a judgment call only you can make. Um, would I file a lawsuit to get a baby Jesus out of a fire station lawn? Well, I probably wouldn't give a shit. I mean, I, is it, are they supposed to do that? No. Is he going to go and, and file a lawsuit to demand that churches don't, aren't treated differently as 501c3 organizations than everybody else who has to file all, all this paperwork? Churches get a pass and they get to write off a bunch of stuff that these people don't. Well, let's level the playing field and let's demand equal transparency. Let's eliminate er, uh, the, the double standard for churches. An unpopular fight, but it's a fight worth making. I, I know it's, it's, we're going to be the bad guys in many ways for a while. But I always think the first one through the wall is the one who gets bloody. You know, the first one through the wall is the one who gets bloody. Ten years, twenty years from now, the fights I think we make today, and I'm not trying to romanticize it too much, but I honestly think that the inroads we make today will make it easier for the people sitting in a room like this in the year 2033 where they're able to do more to be able to, to have a, a greater separation of, of fact and superstition. And to be able to see that, uh, you know, we aren't a, a, an agenda-driven, evangelism-driven country. This country was founded by people trying to escape the long arm of religious oppression, for Pete's sake. And they wanted to celebrate people who wanted to be religious, but this isn't a, a Christian country. Um, I'll, let's do one more and I'll, I'll let you guys... Yeah, I'm going to jump in here on the Riverside thing, not that I know anything about it or anything. <laughs> but uh, the, Riverside went deeper than them just wanting to do an invocation. They had planned to sing three hymns after that invocation. And there were more than one atheist kids involved. There were, there were several. And um, one of the reasons that I agreed to do the radio interview, a lot of you know that I went on the radio and then I got all public about stuff, is that I think it's really important, even after the decision has been made, not to do that, not to have the invocation even. And, and truthfully, the city canceled the graduation not because of the invocation kerfuffle, but because there was controversy, period. They had been planning to cancel the sixth grade graduation because it was a pain in the butt. So that's why it really got canceled. Um, nevertheless, 
One of the reasons that the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers exists and one of the things that we are more than willing to do is to go ahead and get bloody for you. And if you know somebody who's got a situation and who needs to remain anonymous because quite frankly the bullying that happens in schools when people speak up is horrendous. Jessica Alquist is a prime example of that. There is a kid in Oklahoma, in Muldrow, who just experienced this. He was, uh, when other atheist kids in school started getting bullied because they thought that he was, they were the, the other kids were the ones that were raising the stink about the Ten Commandments. This kid stepped forward and said, no, actually it was me. Don't bully them, bully me. And he just got a thousand dollar scholarship from FFRF because of his efforts. When something goes wrong, when you see a violation of the separation of church and state, it is important to speak up and if you're worried about being bullied, if you're worried about the bad things that might happen, contact us. Contact me, it's on the website, you can contact me. I don't mind being public. I'll talk to anybody about anything and I'll get in their faces over it, I don't mind. She's such a wallflower. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that, it's always been my problem, I don't know. But, um, We, we do, and Americans United as well. We've got three organizations that will back us up, and American Atheists will too, so make that four. Um, and, and I've talked to the leaders of all those in their legal departments, and um, I'm registered with all of them to be able to file suit here in Arkansas on behalf of our members, and on behalf of people who aren't our members but want our help. So be aware that we are here. And now Judd had a question. I'm a high school teacher. Um, I'm the gay teacher, I'm one of the atheist teachers. And uh, you know, the, the statistics that say that children are falling away from faith and less of the young people are acknowledging religion at all, are we not seeing uh, callousness and uh, a dissatisfaction with the religious marketing scheme? Just what's your opinion on that? I feel like Dr. Phil here, I just like... Uh... <laughs> What's important, in my opinion, to young people today is not what was important to their parents when they were kids. You look, my, my parents and their generation came from, they were fighting out against all of the, the evil and the corrupt. I mean, they came from the generation where they were, right? Elvis was evil, right? You can't shoot television of him on the Ed Sullivan show from the waist down because the gyration of his hips, that's him channeling Satan right there. <laughs> They burned albums. Remember in the, back when pinball was coming into, uh, was a big deal, there became this big moral uh, fight against the, the evils of pinball. They had pinball machines destroyed. They used to have bonfires where they'd throw in Ozzy Osbourne albums. And they, you know, and heaven forbid, forgive the expression, you'd be homosexual, right? They were really freaky about uh, gay rights and all of this stuff. We, they came out of when, when people, uh, there were still w drinking fountains for whites and for coloreds, for Pete's sake, you know. And, and, and you always found them sort of defending a, lo a lot of this old school ground. Um, you know, the, f the fight to keep homosexuals from enjoying the rights of married people is not a fight our young people care about. You wanna know why? They don't, because they're friends. They know people who are gay and love them. And they live in an age where being gay has become more culturally accepted, I believe more evolved and enlightened, right? We're not putting people in this villain cookie cutter and saying because their sexuality does not look like mine, they are perverse and I am holy and moral. No, we're seeing it through more dimensions. We're learning more about human sexuality, where it comes from. They don't care about that stuff. They're not as interested in the, in the machine. They're not as interested, they're interested in world hunger. They're interested in, in uh, maybe global warming, I don't know. They're interested in, in trying to fix stuff. And the stuff that's important to them is not w keeping gay people from being, from having the rights of, of any married, married couple. Um, I just think that there's, a, there's been a perspective change in the last couple of decades. And uh, the church is going to be pretty, I mean, look, how in the year 2013 can any woman champion the Bible? 
Right? This is the book, this is the book that says, shut up, right? Paul, shut up, go home. You can tell your husband, and then he can come talk to me, but you don't talk to me. How can any woman champion this book in the year 2013, you know? Well, this is not the stuff. The, the women's rights, human rights, these are important to the up-and-coming generation. Now, it could be for a variety of causes, and many of them are beyond me, but it's happening. And I really think that they're just fed up with the crap. They're fed up with the stained glass and with the stuffed shirts and with the platitudes and the threats of hell. And you can even see it in church doctrine. Churches are having to modify their... How does the Word of God get changed? It's the Word of God. Well, hell is a real place and you don't want to go there. Well, actually, you know, hell's temporary. Uh, you don't burn forever. No, don't pay any attention to Matthew chapter 10. No. You know what? Hell is not burning. Hell is separation from God. It's not, you know, actually hell is the grave, you know. Hell is you just die. You know what, I don't believe in hell. I think that was, <laughs> right? Well, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right, in the book of Hebrews, how does His Word change? How does truth change? He's not. We're talking about people, and they're having to modify and change to mold. Look at the Catholic Church, right? They've had to change tons of stuff just to keep from being laughed, um, not out of church, but laughed uh, out of the conversation. Because the world has changed, the evidence has improved. If they don't improve, they're going to be in even worse shape, so they get creative and they silly putty this stuff as best they can to try to fit the situation. It's only going to get worse. You know, if you look at, we did a statistic, uh, the, uh, the most, they, have a, they have a peace index for countries around the world, the countries that have the highest standard of living or have the most peace, the highest level of happiness. And they have all these things that qualify that. The top three in the list were non, or largely non-religious. Well, how does that happen if we're less trustworthy than atheists? Right? They have, they have low crime. They have high prosperity. They have a high satisfaction with living. They have a high morality. You know? Somebody tell me Japan is, is got it, has got it wrong. These people aren't out there riding in the streets, and yet they are largely non-religious. Well, honestly, if you and I were as, as monstrous and just um, unworthy of trust as they say, there, it should be gun smoke out there in the streets. And instead, you'll see that the, the countries that have the largest amount of peace and, and largely the largest amount of happiness largely are non-religious. And I think that's pretty telling. Um, I wanted to kind of leave you, if I can, with a word of encouragement. I, I always feel like sometimes when I look at my past that I, sh I have to apologize. You know, when Teresa McBain spoke to the American Atheists in 2012, she came out for the first time and showed her face. She'd done my radio show six months before anonymously under another name. She called herself Lynn. And she said, I'm currently in the pulpit. I'm trying to get out. I'm a member of the clergy project. Nobody knows. But I want you to know that I got encouragement from listening to your show. And then she came out. And she had this big speech prepared. And she tossed it. She was about to say something to this throng of 1,200 people. And uh, she just tossed it. And she stood up and she said, I want you to know how sorry I am for saying the things I said against gay people or saying the things I said against the people who didn't agree with me or who fell outside of my religious cookie cutter. And I hope you'll forgive me for that. And in many ways, I, I find myself saying, I, I want you to know that I'm sorry for how I used to feel about non-believers, about, about people who were different than me, about people who I didn't understand, about people who... who um, I had painted as caricature because it was easy to do, because I'd been taught to do it. And you know, I look at you guys, and I'm not going to get all Hallmark on you tonight, <laughs> but uh, I see smiles, and I see goodwill, and I see people who, I have no doubt, you love your families, and you love your town, and you love your country, and you know, you, you, aren't, you aren't the cartoon that you have been painted out to be. You deserve more credit than you have been given. I believe that today is your day. I believe that this is your decade. And I believe that the hard stand and the hard fight that you are making today, individually as a couple with your children, 
with your community, with organizations like the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers, I think the hard stand you make today is, is going to change lives, positively. Change lives. Now what better life calling could you have? What better Great Commission could we have than to go out and carve a path that makes the trail easier for others who come behind us to walk with their family and their friends? And I just want to encourage you that you're not alone, you can, there'll be a podcast there every week as long as you guys want to keep listening to it. <laughs> I'll keep producing videos as long as you guys want to keep watching. I will do my best to try to not screw up what we've started or to betray the trust that has been sort of given to me by, by you and people like you. And to know that I'm honored and privileged to be considered sort of part of your family. Many of us, we've, we've suffered some casualties in our circle, in our inner circle in some ways. We've, we've got some battle scars over the, the hard stand we've made, but we've still got family. You've still got family. We still have each other. And I, I'm just honored to be able to be in a room with you. And, and if there's any one thing I could leave you with, it's that. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>